Hello, I'm standing at the foot of the Baldwin Steps on Davenport Road, and now I hear you asking yourself, Self, why is he starting a video about Toronto's shoreline several kilometers inland? Well, follow me up the steps and we'll talk about it. At the end of the last ice age, about 13,000 years ago, the ice sheet retreated from Toronto, but farther east it was still blocking the St. Lawrence River. So the only drainage from this area was toward the south into what today is the Hudson River in New York State. As a result, instead of Lake Ontario, there was a much larger lake called Lake Iroquois with a water level about 30 meters higher than today's lake. As the ice sheet continued to recede, it opened up further drainage avenues, including ultimately the St. Lawrence, and the lake level plunged to about 20 meters below today's level. The first humans who discovered this site, obviously indigenous people, lived for thousands of years with a lake level lower than today's level, and much of the archeological record will be somewhere offshore, even out beyond where Toronto's islands are today, buried under the lake. The weight of over a kilometer of thickness of ice really weighs the land down. So once the ice sheet retreated, a process called post-glacial rebound began, most notably toward the east end of the lake, where the ice had remained for the longest time. As the land rose, it choked off drainage, raising the water level in the lake. And it's been somewhere around today's level for the last few thousand years. In the 1950s, the Moses Saunders power dam near Cornwall was built and that regulates lake levels today. They still fluctuate a bit, leading to floods like we saw on the Toronto Islands in 2017 and 2019. And here we are at the top of the steps. If you're counting your steps, you can add 110 to your total. Some sources say 134, but I counted. It's one of the skills I learned in my school. The view here is lovely. Oh, there's some idiot standing in the way. I can fix that. Thirteen thousand years ago, the view from here would have been water as far as the eye can see. Davenport Road, where we started at the bottom of the steps, roughly follows the Lake Iroquois shoreline. There's a well-known incline on Avenue Road south of St. Clair that vehicles have trouble climbing every time we have a winter storm. That's Lake Iroquois too. As an aside, if you ever wondered why Oakville has a road called Iroquois Shore Road that's nowhere near the lake shore, well, if you don't know, now you know. Oh look, Castle Loma, built by Sir Henry Pellet. I mentioned him in one of my previous videos. I'll put a magic link up here and a link down in the description. And now you probably want that idiot to disappear again, so. I'm standing in front of Fort York, constructed in the 1790s near the mouth of Garrison Creek. They chose this location to protect the entrance to Toronto Harbor. The entrance was just there somewhere. Obviously nowhere near where it is today. This is Union Station, and this is Front Street. As you might have guessed from the name, it's not a coincidence. When this street was laid out in 1796, it followed the shoreline, which was just south of here. That was Mother Nature's shoreline. Since then, we've mucked around with it a lot. It's now about 750 meters that way. So let's go and see some of the changes. We're now south of Front Street. This street is the Esplanade. That is the back end of St. Lawrence Market, a Toronto landmark. This area is the result of landfill in the mid 1800s. The railways paid to fill this in in exchange for being able to run their tracks along here towards Union Station. But this is not where the waterfront is today. So let's keep going south.
We are at the foot of Bathurst Street, looking at the Western Gap, one of the two entrances to the harbour. On the south side of the Gap is Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport, commonly just called the Island Airport. This spot is hundreds of metres south of where we were at Fort York. The original harbour entrance was shallow and a hazard to navigation, and it couldn't be dredged deeper because the bottom was solid rock, so instead they dug a new channel about 400 metres south, using the dredged material both to fill in the old channel and expand the island. The ferry ride between the mainland and the airport is one of the shortest scheduled ferry routes in the world. Until a pedestrian tunnel opened in 2015, it was the only way to access the airport. Behind me is the Toronto Harbour Commission building. It's about 400 metres south of Front Street. When it was built in 1917, it was right at the water's edge. In fact, as you can see from this 1919 photo, it was at the end of a wharf extending out into the lake. But it was only at the water's edge for a few years before the shoreline was extended south yet again. One interesting thing about this building is there's a spelling mistake carved into the building on three sides. Here's a close-up photo of it. The name of the Harbour Commission was spelled correctly, and as far as I can tell, all of its predecessors were spelled correctly. I don't know why this building is misspelled. I haven't been able to find anything. If you have a good reference, I'd be happy to hear about it. Leave it in the comments. And here we are about 350 meters south of the Harbour Commission building, just next to the Jack Layton Ferry Terminal. This is today's shoreline, and just behind me, of course, are the Toronto Islands. Now they've changed over the years too. They used to be a peninsula until a pair of massive storms in 1852 and 1858 severed them from the mainland at what is today the Eastern Gap. Here endeth the video for today. If you've enjoyed this, you know what to do. Please like and subscribe. And now I'll get the idiot out of the way so you can enjoy the view.